living and dead who did these things, we dedicate this program... The Dam Busters! Presented by the author himself, Paul Brickhill, dramatized by Morris West, an Australasian radio production. Speaking. Now they were given a number, Guy Gibson's men felt that the new squadron had really been born, and all of them cheerfully assisted in the christening ceremony. 617 Squadron. It was a lusty infant, but it wouldn't come of age until it, until it had achieved its purpose, and none of them knew what that purpose was. Gibson hoped he would learn something of it when he was ordered to report to Weybridge Railway Station, where he would be met by a certain man. Hello, Guy. Mutt. <laughs> Mutt Summers. Eh? Are you the man I'm looking for? Well, if you're the man I'm waiting for, I am. I've got the car waiting outside. Come on. Uh, where are we going, Mutt? Vickers Works. Vickers? Oh, I don't get it. What's all this about? Oh, you'll find out. You wanted to be a test pilot for me once, remember? <laughs> sure, I remember. <laughs> Seems a long time ago. And what's this, a test job? Oh, sort of. It's not for me, but it is a test job. Well, who's it for, then? For a man named Wallace. Barnes Wallace. I'm glad you've come, Gibson. Now we can get down to it. There isn't a great deal of time left. I don't suppose you know anything about the weapon. Weapon? I've never even heard of a weapon. In fact, I haven't heard much about anything. Huh? Well, don't you even know the target? Not the faintest idea. Oh, my dear boy. Oh, my dear boy. Well, that makes it very awkward. Well, after all, Mr. Wallace, if I'm the man to do the job... I know, I, I know, but this is dreadfully secret. And I can't tell anyone whose name isn't on this list. This is damn silly. Oh, you'll get used to that. Well, I'll tell you as much as I dare, and I hope the AOC will tell you the rest when you get back. Well, it's nice to have someone tell me something. You'd better sit in on this too, Mutt. All right, Mr. Wallace. Well, now, <clears throat> there are certain objects in enemy territory which are quite big and vital to the German war effort. They're so big that ordinary bombs won't hurt them. But I got the idea for a special type of bomb which, if dropped at a certain point on the target, would destroy it by transmitted shock waves. Uh, transmitted shock waves? I don't get that. You see them working in the pubs, Guy. A dozen times over. The shop halfpenny board. Remember how you get two or three pennies lying touching each other and you flick another one in behind them? The shock waves go r right through them, but they all stay where they are except the front one, which goes skidding off. Well, that's the shock wave. Oh, now I get it. Oh, I thought you would. Before you go, I'm going to show you some films which show how a bomb aimed and dropped over water can be brought to land at the base of a structure. Uh, you'll have to drop my special bomb in the same way on the German target. We'll be operating over water? Yes, over water. At night, or in the early morning when it's very flat. Now, tell me, Mr. Gibson, can you fly to these limits? 240 miles an hour, at 60 feet, and still bomb accurately. Well, it's terribly hard to judge a height over water, particularly smooth water. Well, um, how much margin of error is allowed? None. That's the catch. You must fly at 60 feet. No more, no less. Otherwise, your aiming won't be accurate. Well, there's probably a way of doing it. You'll just have to find it, that's all. You'll have to find it very quickly, Gibson, because if you fail the first time, you won't get a second chance. <laughs> I don't know what he said. 
Here's the group care coming in. All right, boys. Break it up. Come on, break it up. Uh, I've got some more information about this assignment of ours. Not all the information, but some of it. We've got a lot of problems to solve, and I can't solve them all by myself. So I want the benefit of your experience. If you've got any ideas, let's have them. Right. Here's the first problem. We will have to bomb in the early morning or late night, possibly in mist. What are the best conditions for training? Hmm. Oh, uh, I'd say moonlight, guy. Moonlight, that's not a idea. But you don't get much reliable moonlight in this country. Well, that's true enough. Um, couldn't we stooge around in dark glasses? Oh, it's not so good. I've tried it. You can't see your instruments properly. Uh, just a minute. Um... I seem to have heard about a new type of synthetic night training. They put transparent amber screens around the perspex. And the pilot wears blue glasses. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe it's just like night flying, but you can see your instruments. Now, uh, I'll see if Satterley can rake up the equipment for us. Now, the next problem is that we've got to come in over the target at 60 feet. What? Oh, 60 feet? That's blue murder, guy. I know. But that's the way it's got to be done. Oh, hell, Guy, you, you can't navigate at that height. What do you mean, you can't navigate? Well, when you're flying as low as that, you can't see much of the area. They say you'll need large-scale maps, plenty of detail. Oh, that's another problem. With large-scale maps, you have to keep folding and unfolding. They're too big. Oh, it's all right. You can get strip maps. Uh, put them on rollers. You, you know, like, like a, a window blind. Right. Now, yeah. we'll settle on that. Large-scale maps in strips and on rollers. I'll organize it. The next point is... we'll be flying over water. Oh, oh water! No. No. Oh, yes. That means we'll have to do our training over the lakes and fens. Astol, I want you to do a series of recce flights over these areas and bring me back as many photographs as you can. No, then the boys can start training. Okay, guy, I'll fix it. Uh, uh, what about the regulations? They say no low flying. There'll be a lot of complaints. <laughs> I'll deal with the complaints. <laughs> uh, listen, how do you get an accurate check on your altitude when you're flying at 60 feet above water? I don't know. I'm going to try and find out. And if you bright boys have got any ideas, you might let me know. <laughs> 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 all right, that's all for now. First flight orders will be posted at 0900 hours tomorrow morning. 60, 60 feet over water and in mist. Holy smoke. Oh, uh, i Gibson. Oh, come in. Sit down. Thank you, sir. Well, how are you making out? All right, except for one thing. Hmm? What's that? Barnes Wallace tells me we've got to come in over the target with water underneath us at 60 feet. No more, no less. Yes, that's right. There's no margin of error. I haven't yet found a way of doing it. If you work on your altimeter, you can be a long way out, especially over Germany. Yes, Yes, I know that. Anyway, we'll think of something. Now, did Wallace tell you anything about the target? No. He was very cagey about that, sir. He has orders to be uh, cagey, as you call it. Yeah. However, I'm going to show them to you now. You can't train your men properly until you know what they are. But you must keep the knowledge to yourself. You understand that? Yes, sir, I understand. Good. Right. Through here. Well, there they are, Gibson. Take a good look at them. Dams. <laughs> dams. That's right. Three of the most important dams in Germany. The Myrna, the Edo, and the Sorpa. Between them, they keep the whole of the raw industries going. 
These are scale models showing the dams themselves and the surrounding countryside. What a mess they'll make. If you can breach them. Yes, if we can breach them. All right, Gibson. Now you know the score. Go and see Barnes Wallace again, then come back and report to me. Well, Gibson, how did you get on? Cochrane gave me the full gen. It's quite a job. Can you do it, do you think? In daylight, we stand a fair chance. At night, I doubt it very much. And so far, we've discovered no way of flying accurately at 60 feet. Oh, we'll find some way. Uh, by the way, the code word for this operation is downward. Downward. Now remember it. Hmm. Now, to take my first explanations a little further... The bombs will be aimed so that they strike through the water at the base of the retaining wall. I calculated that the first bomb should at least crack the wall, and then more bombs in the same place should make it topple over. The best times, of course, are when the dams are full. That'll be in May. You'll need moonlight. There's a full moon from the 13th to 19th of May. About six weeks. It's not very long to train for an operation like this. I know that, but that's all the time you've got. And you've got to be accurate. If you aim too far back, you won't breach the wall. If you overshoot, you'll hit the parapet. Will that hurt the dam? Not at all. But it'll hurt you. Your aircraft will be just 60 feet over the exploding bomb. Uh, yes. Yes, I see what you mean. But it still boils back to the problem of flying dead level at 60 feet. <laughs> Sorry to be late, sir. I missed the connection from Weybridge. Had to get a special car. Did you see him, Wallace? Yes. He's given me more gen. He's as concerned as I am over the altitude problem. You see, it affects our training as well. And I we... think we've got the answer, Gibson. I'm sure we have. What is it, sir? Here it is. I've had the background boys at the air industry working on it. Now, look. You put a spotlight under the nose of the aircraft and another under the belly. You angle them downwards and inwards so that they cross at 60 feet. When you come in over the water, you dive until the point of convergence hits the water, and uh, there you are. As simple as that. I'll uh, tell you something, Gibson. Do you know where the boffins got the idea? I couldn't imagine. One of them went to see a striptease show, and they threw two spotlights on the girl, one from either side of the stage. I never saw much merit in that sort of entertainment, but I do now. Yeah, so do I. Now we can go ahead without any hitches. I hope. Just as the broad outline of Wallace's dam-busting scheme seemed impossible to the authorities when he first expounded it, later the detail of it seemed incredibly difficult to Gibson. But Air Vice Marshal Cochrane was not worried by difficulties. He and Wallace believed that all problems concerning this plan could be overcome, and it was the task of 617 Squadron to overcome them. Gibson was given about six weeks to have his crews ready to attack the Ruhr dams sometime between the 13th and 19th of May. He broached the subject of training with the Australian pilot, Mickey Martin. Listen, Mickey, there's only six weeks to deadline. Oh, blazes, Guy, we've got a hell of a long way to go yet. Not quite so far now that we know how to gauge our height correctly. How are the boys going on low flying? <laughs> Pretty good, Guy. A couple of the crews came in last night with branches and leaves on their radiators. Mm -hmm. That should be low enough for anybody. Have you had them out over the sea yet? Yeah, the first flights went out over the Dogger Bank today. Got themselves shot up by naval gunners and shore flat. <laughs> Serve them right. We'll give them a taste of what they can expect over the... over where we're going. Is it still like that? Sorry, Mickey, it's still like that. Any other problems? Yes, and this one's a big one. The boys have been practicing low-level bombing on the range at Wainfleet. At 60 feet, the drops aren't at all accurate. 
The boy's fault or the bomb site? The bomb site. I've tested it myself. At that level, there's a big margin of error. Oh, I don't like the sound of that, Mickey. I'd better talk to Cochrane about it. Um, tell me one thing, Guy. Yeah? Well, I've been on a few trips in my time, but there's never been one that's had so much briefing or preparation. Now, why is that? Because it's so big, Mickey, it could shorten the war by years, and because if we miss the first time, we'll never get another crack. I'll be away for 24 hours. Keep the boys at it while I'm gone. And for Pete's sake, get us a new bomb site. Well, you seem to be having your share of trouble, Gibson. Yes, sir. Now it's the bomb site. At 60 feet, it isn't accurate enough. You're sure it's the bomb site and not the bomb aimers? Yes, sir. Hmm. All right. This is another job for the backroom boys. Excuse me. Get me the Ministry of Aircraft Production, Wing Commander Dan. Thank you. Now, Gibson, while we're waiting for this, there's something else. Wallace has just finished the two prototypes of the new bomb. They're going to be tested tomorrow at Hearn Bay. I want you to go down and watch them. Take your bombing leader with you. Very good, sir. What time are we supposed to... Uh, Cochrane here. Is that Wing Commander Dan? This is an urgent job. How soon can you get down to see me? Hmm? Tomorrow morning? Fine. Yes. Yes, we're having trouble with low-level sighting on a specified target. I've got models here. I'd like you to see them. They may help you. Hmm? Good man. I'll expect you. Dan's a good man, Gibson. He'll dream up something for you. Very good, sir. Now, what time am I due at Hearn Bay tomorrow? 10.30. Take a car straight out to the beach. Wallace will be waiting for you. Oh, you'll need a pass. The security boys will have the area cordoned off. Hang on a minute, and I'll have one made out for you and your bombing leader. Sorry to get you up so early, Gibson, but the tide's up and that's the right time. We want to walk out at low tide and see how the bomb stands up to the shock of dropping. And what's the aiming point? They're out there, between the two white boys. You see? Uh, yes, I see. They're making the run now. There are two of them. One's the camera aircraft. Watch carefully now. There'll be a lot of spray and if the casing cracks, you'll see fragments. He's too high! He's coming in too high! A lot of fragments, you see? Case is broken. I said it wouldn't work. Bomb's too big and heavy and the case is too light. It shatters as soon as it hits the water. Now he still came in too high. He was over 100 feet. I, I know. Well, we've got another bomb in the hangar. We'll try it again this afternoon. Yeah, just hang on to my coat, will you? What are you going to do, sir? I'm going to wade out and see if I can pick up some of the fragments. They might tell us something. It's going to be a cold swim. Oh, needs must when the devil drives. They're making a better approach this time. Yes. Keep your fingers crossed, Gibson. If this casing breaks, I, I don't know what we're going to do. He's dead on this time. I wait for it. It held! The casing held! Thank God for that. Hello, Chiefy. Like a lift? Oh, I would indeed, Miss Lehman. Where to, Chiefy? Uh, admin offices. Wing Commander Gibson. Quite an honour, Chiefy, to be driving special ops personnel. What do you know about special ops, Margot? Oh, nothing much. Except the boys are doing a lot of low flying and they're all specially picked men. I've never seen anybody fly the lengths as low as they do. Now, you're a nice girl, Miss Lehman, and I like you. So I'll give you a piece of advice. Squadron 617 is not a thing to talk about. It's dynamite. Understand? Yes, of course I understand. And I'll tell you another thing. That's why I'm going to see Wing Commander Gibson now. Some silly fool wrote a letter to his girl. 
And is he going to catch trouble? Oh, I see. I see. Well, there you are, sir. There's the letter. The uh, censors picked it up last night. The, uh, the uh, passages have been marked in blue. Oh, show me. The aircraft have been flying low with special night aids for some special operation. Who is this ruddy fool? One of the fitters, sir. What sort of a man is he? Oh, he's a good type, sir, and a good fitter. I think, sir... Yes, Chiefy? Well, I think if you were to have him up here and tear a few strips off him, he wouldn't make the same mistake twice. In my opinion, sir, it's... Uh, well, I think it's just a slip, sir. All right, flight. Run him up to me. I'll give him a lesson he won't forget in a hurry. Gibson here. Oh, this is security here, sir. Yes? As you know, sir, we're tapping all telephone calls. Yes, yes, I know that. A call was made last night to a girl in London. One of my personnel? Uh, yes, that's right, sir. Air crew. Well, don't mention his name on the phone. Send it around to me in an envelope. What did he say? Um, sorry, I won't be down tomorrow night. I'm flying on special training. Is that all? Yes, that's all, sir. Right. I'll deal with it as soon as you send me his name. Thanks for calling. Oh, the fools. The blind, boneheaded fools. Why can't they keep their silly trap shut? Gibson here. Give me the adjutant. Hello. Look, all air crews of 617 Squadron to assemble in the mess at 0300. Yes. Yes, all air crews. <laughs> all right, chaps. Break it up. I want to talk to you. You there. Stand up on the table. Who? Uh, me? Yes, you, pilot officer. Go on, stand up on the table. <laughs> you see this fellow? He's a pal of yours, isn't he? He carries badges of rank just the same as you do. He's air crew, which gives him special privileges. He's a nice chap. Or so you'd think. He's got a girlfriend in London. He probably carries a photograph around in his pocket. Oh, of course he does. <laughs> she probably thinks he's the last word in heroic British manhood. <laughs> he telephoned her last night. And while he was telephoning her, he gave her a piece of information that could have cost the lives of every man jack of you. <clears throat> here's, what, here's what this man said. And for the information of the rest of you, every phone out of this station is tapped by security men. This is what this clot said to his girl. Sorry, I won't be down tomorrow night. I'm flying on special training. Harmless, isn't it? I'll show you how harmless it is. The girlfriend babbles in a bar or where she works about a hero who's doing special training. An enemy agent hears it, he traces it to this station. And the night we go out on our mission, there's flak and fighters and a balloon barrage and everything else in the box of tricks lined up waiting for us. Now look at him. Look at the fool. Hundreds of men's lives in danger because one idiot can't keep his trap shut. Now if this happens again with any single one of you, I'll have the man court-martialed and dismissed from the service. That's all. Sit down, Gibson. You know uh, what today is? April the 29th. That's right. Only 13 days to the full moon. 13 days to the final test. Now then, give me a training check. Hello, flying? Good, sir. Mickey Martin's done a wonderful job. Mm. The boys can come in, moonlight or mist, over any target and hold the crate steady at 60 feet. Good. 
Very good. Well, maybe? Very good. Uh, your man from the air ministry made up a gadget for us out of nails and chunks of wood. Yeah. Well, it was child's play now. Mm. How about security? Well, uh, oh, a few minor breaches, but no, it's still good. I see. Well, Gibson, the water in the dams is rising. If you're not ready by the 13th of May, you won't be ready at all. And the raids will have to be put off for another year. We'll be ready, sir. But uh, will Wallace be ready with his... Excuse me. Cochran here. Hello. Yes. Yes. I see. Thank you very much. That was Wallace on the line. Final tests on the bomb have been completed. And it works, Gibson. It works. Thank you.